these are the conversations that I think help me stay energized and eager to dive back in and, and have my next session because it's, it's hard work that we do. It's very rewarding, but it's very hard. Hello, welcome to The Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders to those of us who have been around for a while. I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. A skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. All right. Welcome to the Seasoned RD Podcast, or welcome back if you've been here before. Today's conversation is with Kate Scafati. She's a licensed clinical social worker. We go in lots of different directions and every single direction just reminded me of the connections out there with professionals that I still have yet to encounter and meet, but who all I get to meet through this podcast and share with you all. Some things that are highlights she shares that transgender non-conforming clients are at much higher risk for eating disorders. Also, We can hold the client as an expert, but not in the role of responsibility or educating others or us. And we talk about body neutrality versus body acceptance or body positivity. There's many ways to refer to this vehicle that we have in our body, and language matters. When she was talking about Erin Harrop, I was thrilled to know that we had secured Erin for a podcast interview in early 2023, so please stay tuned. Another thing, we talked about a professionals in recovery SIG through the Academy for Eating Disorders, and I wanted you to know Kate has started and is facilitating a group at Within for eating disorder professionals who are struggling in their recovery. She's really excited to offer this. I'm excited she is too. She said, to our knowledge, it's the first of its kind. And Kate didn't have a link yet, but if you're interested, reach out via the website and look under PHP IOP and just let you let them know that you would like a confidential assessment. If you want to connect with me for supervision, please make sure that you're signed up for my supervision freebies. Information is in the show note. What this podcast is and is not. In this podcast, we bring medical, professional, nutrition therapy professionals who share their passions to pique your interest in available modalities for the field of eating disorders. This show is intended to inform and educate. It is not a substitute for professional training and supervision required to specialize, nor is it a substitute for medical, nutritional, or psychological advice from a professional or specialist. Information is in the show note. What this podcast is and is not. In this podcast, we bring medical, professional, nutrition therapy professionals who Share their passions to pique your interest in available modalities for the field of eating disorders. This show is intended to inform and educate. It is not a substitute for professional training and supervision required to specialize, nor is it a substitute for medical, nutritional, or psychological advice from a professional or specialist. Welcome, Kate Scafati, to the Seasoned RD podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So we're going to ease you on into things with a few icebreakers. And my first one for you is mountains or beach? Beach. Beach. I grew up in Southern California. Okay. Okay. I see that your background is kind of like maybe a mountainy look. So I was curious. Yeah. My second one is breakfast or dinner? Hmm. That's a tough one. I'm going to go with dinner because I feel like it lends itself typically to being a more social meal. So I could think about like going out with friends. And I also, I think if I had to choose, I would go savory. And for me, that that's more in line with my preferences for dinner. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a lot of people, isn't it, Abby? That It's like the social piece of it is something that's important to us. Absolutely. And the last one is audio book or paper book. Paper book. No question. That was fast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Kate, 
you are a licensed clinical social worker and yes. that requires an exam, right? For licensure or it does. And a certain number of hours of supervision okay. which changes state to state. Okay. So not to try to traumatize you, but I'd like to bring you back to that exam day. What do you remember from that? So actually as a social worker, as, as an LCSW or LICSW, depending on the state, I have taken two exams. So there's the exam you take out of school for your license, LMSW. And then there's a second clinical exam for many of us. And there's also different levels of exam, depending if you're going in different specialty areas. I'll talk about the most recent one because I think it was the more interesting experience because I took it during COVID. And so I had registered for it and then delayed it, delayed it. because I wasn't sure how I felt being in a, you know, small room with people I didn't know. So that was actually pretty, pretty fun. And it's, it's a good memory because I took it in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is about 20 minutes from where I live. And the day of the exam, we were getting a big snowstorm. And so I didn't know if I was going to even make it, but they were open and it took me quite a while to get there. And I remember walking along the the river there and from Jersey city to Hoboken, my giant parka and my hood up and all the snow coming at me and meeting people in the basement of the building, waiting to go up and making small talk about like, Oh, you know, so much anxiety. What test? Cause you, the, the testing centers see people from all different disciplines. So I was testing with like nursing people and, and all kinds. And I walked into the, the bathroom outside the center to, to kind of clean up and get ready. And I realized from the snow, my mascara was all over my face and I looked like a raccoon and had been having all these conversations with people with no idea. So that was, that was a funny start to the day. I love that story so much. Yeah, Yeah, because, you know, the anxiety of everything, of taking a test and then having to go through a snowstorm, literally, and then knowing what you looked like as you were making small talk to other people, it's it's humbling. Yes, yes. The nice thing about our exams as social workers is is that we get the result right away. They're computerized and you, you finish the exam and it says like, are you sure? <laughs> Double check. You hit submit and it lets you know if you passed. So that's, that's nice. I think the testing center people know. Yeah. Hands up. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay, good. Well, how, how did you, thank you for that story. How did you get into therapy as a discipline and how did you get into eating disorders work? Yeah, it's a great question. So I have my own lived experience of an eating disorder for many, many years of my life. And over that time, many years ago, not to, not to age myself, I'm happy with all the years that I've had. I really found my therapists and treatment providers so helpful that I wanted to be able to give back to others in that same way. And I think as many of us do in the field, having, having lived experience, really seeing from both sides, right? Bringing that additional layer of, of empathy and compassion and understanding of having been, you know, in that seat on the couch, in that client shoes. Of course, everyone has a different experience, but having an under, I think a deeper understanding of what it means to go through an eating disorder. For sure. And how did you get into the SIG? You're at the AED SIG also, which the is, is for SIG is the special interest, special group? interest group. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'm currently the co-chair of the Professionals in Recovery SIG with Scout, Scout Silverstein, who is just phenomenal and has contributed so much to the field through Fed Up and all of their other work. I, I'd been participating in the Professionals in Recovery SIG for a year or two and just had the opportunity as, as AED rot- rotates out co-chairs, then I had the opportunity to step in. So I just started that this past June during I said. And it's just been a wonderful opportunity to, to learn from others, really. I feel like I'm, I'm standing in very big shoes of, of those that have gone before. I think we have had Beth McGilley on here, and I think she was one of the developers of that SIG. Like, we weren't yeah. allowed to talk about lived experiences as professionals. And this is why this podcast exists, is to bring the old and the new and to help see how we, we navigate through the world and how things get better. Because back when I started, we would not include the parent in some of the care. And that can be really damaging 
We used to think that was the problem. And now we know that we can talk about it, we can include and we can teach and they can be the best ally in, in the treatment. So who scout, tell me, I mean, this is my ignorance, who scout Silverstein? So Scout Silverstein is one of the founders of Fed Up, fighting eating disorders in underrepresented populations. And little plug, they're going to be doing a conference this spring in May. It's going to be hybrid, virtual, and in person in New York for providers. And it's going to be really in depth for providers and underrepresented and marginalized populations, which is I'm I'm super excited. It sounds incredible. Mm-hmm. It does. Abby and I were just talking before you came on that we really need to do a series on that. And I'm, I'm in my own process of learning and learning, getting very uncomfortable before I can get comfortable with even doing that series. And so I'm, I'm consulting with different people along the way to, to make sure that that's the right thing. And so just you introducing us to, to Scout and Fed Up and this program in May, I'm, I'm grateful to that. Okay. So how did you get into the field of eating disorders? So you talked about therapy in general, eating disorders, your own lived experience partially in helping other people. Yes. And then you work for within right now. I do. And it's been quite a road to get here. I originally volunteered with Nita when I was in college many years ago and had the opportunity to work with Lynn Grief, which was fantastic, mm-hmm. really as really as they were moving out to New York. They were still based in Seattle when I got involved. And through that work, I got to do all kinds of like conference work. I did the photography at several conferences, got to really meet a lot of, of different people, mm-hmm. which was phenomenal. I took some time off to continue my own recovery work and also then kind of shifted that. I, I'm creative. Before I became a social worker, I did a degree in art therapy. And so I did a photography project on people in recovery from eating disorders after the HBO kind of documentary thin came out, really feeling like not a great representation of treatment, not a lot of hope for recovery presented and really wanting to show that you know people do get better, right? recovered past tense is a possibility for many people. Mm-hmm. So I did that for a couple of years, which was really fun. I mm, traveled all over the country and met people I wouldn't have met otherwise and got to hear their stories and then went and did my art therapy pr- program where I continued working with clients with eating disorders. That was really always my goal. So I got to do some kind of internship placements at different eating disorder facilities which was fantastic. And so interesting from the art therapy lens and seeing, you know, I got to see some real intersections of, of trauma, of anxiety, of depression, because I always say, you know, it's never quote unquote, just an eating disorder, right? We all have so many other contributing factors. So that was wonderful. And I feel like I'm just kind of giving you my resume now, which feels weird. Oh, uh. oh, I love this though, because I'm <laughs> I'm taking notes off to the side about things that I'm going to come back to. So keep talking. Okay. You're so interesting. Okay. I didn't know these things about you, Kate. Yeah. Because I went to NYU for art therapy, then I had the op- uh, opportunity to work at the NYU Child Study Center for a couple of years doing primary admissions there. And they do general child and adolescent mental health across a wide range of issues, including eating disorders, but I really got to kind of diversify there, which was wonderful. Get some experience with clients with kind of doing these initial phone screens for, you know, autism or ADHD or behavioral disorders, anxiety, depression, all the different things we see start to pop up that may be vulnerabilities, right. That then we see down the road in our clients with eating disorders. And while I was doing that, I had the phenomenal opportunity to go back to NYU and do my, my social work degree and do my, my field placements at the NYU Child Study Center. I got to participate on their comprehensive DBT team, which was just, has been huge and in, in giving me skills to work with our population, as well as the NYU Counseling Center with the college students. And yeah. somewhere in there, I had a baby, <laughs> <laughs> took a little, took a little breather from the eating disorder world, did some part-time substance use work and had another baby and dove right back into the eating disorders world. So I did some admissions work, did some primary program, higher level of care stuff, 
and then was lucky enough to, to connect with Wendy Oliver Pyatt again um, and start at Within really right as we were starting over a year ago. So I've been, I started as a primary therapist at Within in July, 2021, mm-hmm. um, and I'm now a clinical lead and it's just been a phenomenal ride. Yeah. You know, I have not had a chance to overlap much with Wendy Oliver Pyatt other than knowing her name and I'm just learning all of the things. So even the summit last week, so I know this is not going to drop until much later, but in real time, the summit was last week. And for those of you who don't know about the summit, it was this incredible, incredible offering of topics, three days online. I still going through some of them because I couldn't make all of them. And one wanted you to talk about your topic. Skylar and I, Skylar. my computer's having an issue. Skylar yeah. and I had the opportunity to present on really, well, the title was Gender Identity and Body Image, Exploring mm-hmm. Impacts of Societal Expectations on Gender Identity and Body Image in Transgender Individuals with Eating Disorders. Yes. Skylar's phenomenal and, and shared his story of, you know, kind of self-discovery, eating disorder, recovery. And I got to hop in and share some of the clinical considerations and how do we focus on providing affirming care and treatment to these clients? Because it really, it, it, and I think anytime I speak on this topic, I feel like I have to kind of qualify that I identify as a cisgender person, certainly like have done some trainings, have worked with transgender clients, but I, I can't know someone's experience in that way. So, you know, I certainly want to help educate others and kind of have that caveat that, you know, there's many, many people out there that know better than me, but it was a wonderful opportunity and really to be able to share with so many people that transgender clients, gender nonconforming clients are at much higher risk of eating disorders and kind of the considerations that we have given that treatment historically focuses on cisgender white women and, and how do we broaden treatment, not in a reactive, but in a proactive way so that it's affirming care and that that is our, our standard rather than, okay, team, we have a client coming in that identifies as, as trans or GNC, like, here's what we got to do. No, we need to be providing that care all along. And, you know, what I really should have started with is, you know, I'm Kate Scafati, my pronouns are she and her, that needs to be our standard Mm -hmm. so that it's not just, okay, we have someone who, you know, uses different pronouns. So now we have to do that. No, we should be doing that really consistently. There's just so many things that, that we can be doing to that, that are really ultimately not that difficult, right? I know like the timeline on this is going to be different, but there's an article coming out in New York Times Magazine this weekend that quotes Aaron Harrop, who's just an incredible re- right, researcher and, and he's advocate. I, Aaron's an, amazing. But as I was reading it, one of the things I noticed was, you know, they introduced Aaron and then the sentence was Aaron Harrop, who is an eating disorder researcher and uses they, them pronouns. Great that they're doing that but they didn't do that for the cisgender people that they interviewed earlier in the article. So how do we kind of do this consistently for everyone and not kind of single people out in that way? Absolutely. I'm going to say that this is, I'm so glad we're having this conversation, Kate, because like I could have looked at your name on the screen and if you didn't say she, her, I would have to wonder if I'm saying it right or doing it right. And so I appreciate it when people of all identities will identify. And I had to go through my own process to even put she, her on mine. And I show up in all these spaces in Zoom with the she, her. But I I have personally, and it's a really weird way that I came to it, but I was, I have a supervisor or consultant that I work with who's transgender. And I had to ask, is it okay to put she, her on there? And they were like, why wouldn't you? And I said, well, because I don't want to pretend like I'm, like, I understand that 
when I say really weird, Kate, you're going to be like, yeah, Beth, that is kind of weird. Um, but really, honestly, I just didn't want to hang my hat and say that I understand this because I don't. I am a cisgender female white, and I was not comfortable with my identities at that point. Now I've been doing it for about a year and I'm very comfortable with it. And I think that Kate, your description of like, I think everybody should be doing it. I think that's a great, what does it hurt? Right, right. And I appreciate your sharing about like the work that you have to do because we all have to do that work, right? Even as cisgender people, right? It's not just that trans people have done their, you know, gone through their process, we need to reflect on like, what does it mean? Is it just that this has been the default that's always been assumed of me? Mm -hmm. I I don't know. But how do we ask clients to do that work if we've not done it for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And you use the phrase, I can't know it in that way, when you talked about Skylar. And then there's the the tokenism too. Skylar Mm -hmm. has their own identities. And so does Aaron, and so does the the consultant that I use for trans work. We can't know it in that way, and they can't represent their entire transgender folk group in that way. It really right. is understanding each person as an individual. I appreciate that so much. And that was really like what I hoped people would take away from our presentation, or at least from my part of the presentation is to hold the client as the expert, but not as responsible for educating others, right? Because we, we certainly want to understand someone's experience and honor their experience and meet their needs and meet them where they are. But we can't ask someone to come into treatment and educate us. That's not their, that's not their burden. It's so common that we see eating disorders manipulate different things in anyone's life. Just top of mind example, if you're an athlete, how an eating disorder might manipulate exercise. Is that, do you find that there are any differences or things that clinicians should be aware of how eating disorders may or may not manipulate in the trans population? Sure. And I appreciate your frame. I got a little nervous for a minute when I hear the word manipulate, because I'm like, "Mm, that's a tough label for many clients. But when we talk about putting it on the eating disorder, right, we see that all the time. I think in terms of, of the considerations, another one of the big points that we talked about at the summit was, right, focusing on body neutral, body neutrality and using neutral language rather than focusing on body positivity or body acceptance, because if someone is not at home in their body, how can we ask them to just like flat out accept it or let alone feel positive about it? Right. But how can we approach the body as, okay, this is, this is the vehicle you are in at the moment. And there are many possibilities out there and wide range that are going to fit differently for different clients. But for now, this is the vehicle you have and you need to give it adequate fuel and rest and appropriate movement. And right. How can we be at at home as much as we can until we can access whatever those affirming changes might be? I saw you had a nice reaction to that. Huge. I mean, that's the thing that I was asked to be on a Facebook live on body positivity. And before we started, I said, I can't, I can't access that. I can't use that framework. So would it be okay if I use body neutrality? And there's steps along the way. Like what's the first step? First of all, this is the body as a vehicle. I loved that. This is what we have. And maybe that's the best that we can do. And then the next, like, yeah, I just, you said it much more eloquently than I did, Kate, but I did have a big reaction because it is an important thing. And when, when Abby used the word manipulate, yeah, that's, those are things that, and, and what this podcast brings is, is the language that's used in our trainings and what we're brought up in, and then having the, the knowledge of shifting with, with words that might impact people in certain ways. Yeah. I think the, even the word exercise and movement is something that we kind of learn as a shift. Exercise can for people be a word that uh, lands 
in a challenging way on our nervous yeah. systems. Yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe more to your question, Abby, I just want to be really careful about assuming any ill intent tied to a person's gender identity, or even for some people, sexuality or sexual orientation. I think for me, it feels too tricky. It it feels too muddled unless a client themselves came to me and said, I really feel like the eating disorder is co-opting this. I don't think I, I would, I would probably not tend to see it through that lens Mm -hmm. just because in, in this and perhaps other populations that have historically been marginalized, that feels it, it feels like it's leaning into the power dynamic of, of me being the expert and seeing something differently than the client's perspective. Mm-hmm. That's not to say it couldn't happen, but I, I would be kind of careful about that. A quick shout out to the sponsors of today's episode, Within Health. Within Health is unique. It's virtual and comprehensive and personalized treatment for those with eating disorders. It's built on tech-enabled and digitally native platform. Within brings a full multidisciplinary team, remote patient monitoring, and get this next one, food delivery to the home, and aftercare all into the home. And all of this to increase access, improve outcomes, promote healing. Within Health offers virtual partial programs, so PHP and IOP levels of care, depending on each client need. Finally, scheduling is flexible and determined on an individual basis. Within Health treats ages 13 and up and all gender, so check it out in the links. Again, they are in the show notes. I invite you to help me with language too. So one of the things that we're taught as dietitians is you're the nutrition expert in our, (laughs) like, you're the expert, you're the expert, you're the expert. And as we shift over to like, just being with someone, being, you know, we're, we're on this journey together with them is that they are the expert of their own experiences and their own body and their own like that that we have to remember why we're there is to help be alongside and not act as if we're the expert sure we may know a lot about calculating formulas and other things we may know a lot about the medical nutrition therapy piece like how to diagnose malnutrition how to how to understand the the formulas but we're not an expert on someone else's experience, what's going on in their self. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think you said that really well. And I think that's right. That's the dialectic. That's the both. And we need you, we need the RDs to be the expert. I certainly am not. We need you in those moments when the client is saying, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't like that food to come in and say, okay, is this coming from you? Is this coming from the eating disorder to have that and say like, no, your body really needs this fuel right now. And to hold those really important boundaries in the context. Right. And I think this ties in so beautifully to intuitive eating, right. As we move clients toward intuitive eating, how, how do we hand off, right? How do you give that education, give your expertise and then hand it, hand the baton back. Hugely. And even intuitive eating saying that is not available to everyone in all spaces right. <laughs> so yes. i have that on one of my handouts is that that's the phases of recovery the recovery model from back in like reef and reef days it's a it's a a book that so many of us dietitians used in the beginning and and i put an overlay on it of the eating disorder diet ramps up and then we need a structured meal plan to help move through the first phase of recovery. And then it's a bumpy road. You know, it's not just a linear, like, okay, I'm better. And so this whole moving towards intuitive eating, someone helped me see that that was problematic for them, just the term intuitive eating and maybe mindful or tuning in or the understanding what your body's signaling to you or somatic. So again, it's finding that verbiage that really 
doesn't cause a defense in our client and allows us to be with them. Right. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I have like three thoughts going in different directions, but probably first and most importantly, right. That certainly intuitive eating is not accessible to all clients. And if we think about the privilege that's in, inherent in assuming that someone could check in with themselves, say, hmm, this is what I'm in the mood for and have the access to go out and have that food readily available, right? That's that's a huge barrier for so many people. And Carolyn Becker's doing and been doing incredible work mm-hmm. on eating disorders and food insecure populations and the incredible rates of eating disorders, you know, they're seeing down, I think she's based in Texas and how the intervention, like I, I remember hearing her speak and being like, the real intervention is to give to your local food pantry, right? That like bottom line, people have to have access to food. And the other direction my mind was going in was right. Probably conversations you've had before about how do, how do we get into this field? This field is predominantly female and white well-educated and those of us that have access to those things that are able to do unpaid internships, how do we access higher education and how do we bring more diversity to the field? And I know there's an RD group doing some great work on that. I'm, you know, as a social worker, there's, you know, that's, that's kind of our jam, but having that conversation too, because within, I think we're working really hard to have a diverse staff and we do have a diverse staff and everyone can do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Diversity dietetics may be something that you're referring to and food insecurity is going to come out in the core courses for certification this year, which is great. And so trauma informed um, nutrition care. So it's super important. And I have to, I have to put in my, thought about food insecurity, working at a children's hospital eating disorders program for about eight years. Yes, we had a lot of food insecurity and some of it did not have to do with resources being available. Mm -hmm. Um, Some folks had quite a financial ease in their life, but because the parents didn't want their child to be fat, Yep. the food was not available to the kids. And then they would come in and the parents would be so upset because they're finding wrappers in the bedroom or in the whatever it may be, or when they're able to get DoorDash and <laughs> order things in and, and binge on those. It's a food insecurity, not because of the financial inability, but because of the diet culture and body yeah. image culture. Yeah. I feel like I got fired up. I got on my soapbox a little bit. I love these kinds of conversations because I think you're right. There's so much, right. And in some ways we're in our bubble, right. We talk, I think all of it's the human nature. We talk to like-minded people. That's who our friends are. And so sometimes it's hard to step back and, you know, it kind of can be culture shock when you get into the, the broader world and people are like, what's haze? What, what are you talking? What is this language that you're using? Right. And that we don't all exist in that sphere. And how do we gently, perhaps not when I'm all fired up, but invite people in and do that broader education because it's so necessary. That's, that's the world our clients are are stepping back into. Yep. It is. And social media and all of those things that they're in already and they're in the soup and we have to figure it out. And one thing that I had made a comment on my paper over here was not requiring the client to do the teaching for the professionals. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I learned from, from someone too, was the the oops, ouch, and move on. Like if you use the wrong pronouns, if you say something that's harmful, is to allow the client to just be able to say to us that hurt. And then we can say, oops, ouch. And not an apology for them to tell us, hey, you did, you know, or patch it up for us. That's okay, Beth. You didn't mean to, da, da, da. and it's like, no, I don't need to hear that. I want you to be direct with me, and I can say, I'm sorry, and move on. Yeah, exactly. Awesome stuff. 
What about, so Abby, I know that you're going to want to have a wrap-up question, but I do want to ask one more thing about your topic that you did for Within Summit. Just like if you could summarize, and I know this is an, it's an hour and a half, I think was your session, what you wanted people to get out of that. Self-image is part of it. Yeah, I I think it's tricky. And we had some really great questions at the end as well. But I think Skylar did a really nice job responding to one of those questions and saying, like, love protects, right? If we can, when we were talking as, you know, about as parents, how do we support our, our gender diverse kids? If we can show up with love, and if we can honor someone's experience, right? If someone says, this is my experience and tells you who they are, if we can honor that and love them, that is going to be protective, right? And not have to have people explain themselves or prove themselves, right? If, if a kid comes to you and sa- a parent and says, I'm really not sure about my gender, say, okay, I'm here for you. I love you regardless, whoever you are, I'm here to support you, right? That's, that is just huge because so many kids don't have that and it's not safe, right? In, in many areas of our country, it's not safe. I'm getting emotional and I know that our listeners can't see it, but I had been in the room with so many kids whose parents would not, re- not recognize the oops, ouch, or to just continually use pronouns or things that just harmed and so the the love protects this is all I made another note about language the language matters love protects I mean I'm just putting my hands over my heart it is like you do I think most parents love their children unconditionally and you don't want them to be harmed by what would be felt as lack of love Yeah. And, and again, I think it goes back to some of the, the old messages that we had for, and maybe this is a nice way to like bring it in the old messages we had about eating disorders and like blaming the parent. It's, it's not about blaming anyone. Right. It's, a, I think everyone, I, I don't know, as a social worker, I try to walk into the world with, you know, the majority of people I meet have the best of intentions. If we assume everyone has good intentions and are showing up with their best selves, there's things that happen in people's history that contribute to how they see the world. I don't think very many parents, and I know there are parents out there and many of our clients have struggled with that kind of trauma, but many parents, most parents love their children and want the best for their children and not seeing their children as their children are presenting. They're not coming from the opinion. I want to hurt my kid. I'm not going to honor who they are. They just don't have that that worldview and they don't have, it, it feels kind of elitist to say, so I, I'm kind of careful about this, but it feels like they don't have the education or the access to resources to know, like, how do I support this kid? And so how do we as providers then walk out into the world, carry that love and spread that knowledge the best we can? especially hard for the parent because I have a new grandchild and it's a boy, it's a girl. And and I was shopping for something yesterday and the stores have boy sections and girl sections. And it's extra hard for a parent, I would think, to be able to make that shift. Yeah. Yeah. I shared in the presentation, I have one of my kiddos is gender nonconforming, and we've been lucky enough to be in a community and a school that has welcomed him wholeheartedly and that I, I know how lucky we are to have that and that that's not the norm. Mm-hmm. And it really is just going back to the client being the expert, right? My kiddo is the expert on who he is. And mm-hmm. until he tells me differently, then that's, that's who he is. Mm-hmm. And he, he chooses he, him. Yes, he was designated male at birth. He still, he uses he, him, but he is a very big fan of anything rainbow, unicorn, and wears dresses to school every day. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
It seems like compassion is a big theme of our conversations is what I'm getting to. But Kate, we do have a wrap up question for you. So if you were to take yourself back to entering the field of eating disorders, what do you wish you would have known then that you do know now? Mm, that's, oh, that's a great question. Loaded. Take your time. It, it also makes me question like when would I consider myself to have entered the field of eating disorders? Was it when I started volunteering with NIDA? Was it when I got you know, my art therapy degree or my social work degree? So it's an interesting question. I think for myself, I wish I had a more foundational knowledge of health at every size sooner of the social justice issues inherent in everything existing in the world, right? I think these conversations have opened up for many of us over the last few years and that it's not that they weren't present before, but that it didn't feel quite so take a course, read this book and you'll be educated enough. And, and I still don't feel like certainly don't feel educated enough. I can never be educated enough. And then just really, I think to push myself to do more specific training in, in different areas like IFS and oh, I wish I had known about RODBT sooner. And, you know, some of these more specialized areas that AEDP that are, I'm just learning, not just learning about, but like have come to over the past, you know, five to 10 years. And that I, I did that sooner because I've had a really non-traditional course into the field. But at the same time, I don't know. It's It's been my journey and it needed to be my journey to get where I am now. Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to Abby's word about compassion too. It's our journey and you couldn't even really pinpoint when you came into the field, which is so much like so many of our other guests, other professionals in the field of like, it's our journey. And I think I could summarize, I can never be educated enough and I push myself to keep learning. Like yeah. IFS, RODBT, those are... Honestly, that, Kate, is the whole premise of this podcast is how do we know what we need to know? How do we keep learning and how do we keep pushing ourselves in the direction that's going to help all of us and our clients? So yeah. thank you so much for joining us in this podcast episode, Kate. Yeah. Thank you both so much for having me. These are the conversations that I think help me stay energized and eager to dive back in and, and have my next session because it's, it's hard work that we do. It's very rewarding, but it's very hard. Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethharrell.com slash professionals.